Hello, everyone. All right, I have only one announcement this time before I introduce our next speaker. Um, again, uh, after the session, lunch is um, at the expo hall, and there is a 90-minute uh, lunch break after this. And um, make sure you also look at your MY's uh, session agenda. There are lunch and learns also taking place um, during the lunch break. All right, let's get started. I'm gonna announce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Frank Catucci. Frank, come on up. Thank you. So today is, uh, we have eight sessions uh, at this 11.30 time slot, so thank you everyone for coming to this uh, full house. Um, this session is going to be a little bit different on a lot of things that I normally present on. Uh, the last two talks that I did at Black Hat were more in-depth kind of tech talks. Uh, but that being said, this is an important talk and I'm very kind of passionate about it. I've seen DevOps and security and DevOps success, uh, excuse me, result in success and failure multiple times over my career. Um, and 90% of the time, or higher, I would be willing to venture, was because of the concentration on more of the tooling than on the people in the background process that go into a successful DevOps program. Um, so that's what I'm gonna share with you today. So real quick, uh, uh, who am I? My name is Frank Catucci. Uh, first and foremost, I, I, I just wanna make it clear, I'm very passionate about application security. I've been doing application security for uh, a lo long number of years. Um, so that's where most of my background and passions lie. I do a lot of bug bounties, used to do a lot of pen testing. I'm currently the CTO and head of security research at Invicti Security. Invicti offers right now, we, we have, uh, obviously we, we have AppSec products. Now, th this is not gonna be a talk where I, I, I bring up or mention any of our AppSec products or tooling or anything of that nature. Um, just giving you a little bit of background of who I am. So, again, 20 years of experience working closely with engineering and product teams, mostly on the developers, uh, I would say more of a developer focus. Um, I ran OWASP chapter for a number of years in Columbia, South Carolina. I contribute to the OWASP cheat sheets if you've ever used those uh, resources. Um, I am a previous analyst for Gartner, uh, in my past lives. I worked at Data Robot doing a heavy focus in product security for AI. Uh, previous to that, obviously, I, uh, we did a lot of the groundwork for, um, any, uh, for a lot of the AppSec focus uh, related items at Qualys, and I was there for a number of years. Anywhere from a past uh, CISO at a financial organization to a pen tester. Um, Obviously, it's just uh, me who sits at a computer for far too long, especially uh, according to my wife and children. So uh, that being said, why DevSecOps? So again, uh, a little bit of a selfish kind of point of view of coming from more of that developer uh, or that, uh, I would say, engineer perspective. But the reason of why DevSecOps, essentially, is I find that when we're looking to state crucial parts of the business that we're looking to improve due to things of the, the nature of the change of how software is delivered these days, right? So waterfall versus agile, the number of releases, the, the, the quality control of that software that gets released. Um, I'm gonna read from the slide here because I think it's an important statement and I put some thought into this particular sentence. So. I think that DevOps is crucial uh, for security leaderships and development teams as it integrates AppSec into the dev process, but also automates the security testing. Most importantly, builds that culture of collaboration and communication. If I could stress one thing to you about your DevOps programs or your DevSecOps programs being successful, is it's not gonna be because you had a cooler tool than someone else, or you bought a very specific type of uh, snake oil that was being sold. It, it's not that. Uh, ultimately, we're gonna ensure, we're gonna ensure security by building better apps. Um, however, it has to be done correctly to be able to be successful. 
Now, before we go any further, let's take a step back and really think about perhaps, you know, what are, what are the real world benefits um, that we can see? So, um, can we, this is not the final presentation, but we'll go with it. Um, so, uh, improved organizational security, faster time to market, increased collaboration, building software of a better quality and reducing costs. Okay. So let's break those down for a second and look at why that possibly could be important to your org. Um, look, we know if we find vulnerabilities earlier, um, it's gonna improve your overall, let's say security posture, holistic security posture of the org. Because at the end of the day, whether you're reading Verizon DBIR reports or looking at uh, Mandiant reports or whatever you're looking at to pretty much surmise a lot of things that have gone wrong for other organizations, we know that the main entry, port, main entry point into a lot of those breaches uh, is going to be through some web or application facing asset. Um, and that's just the true nature of it, right? And I don't care if you're using credential stuffing, I don't care if you're using traditional exploitation, if you're waiting for a zero day like move it, I don't, it doesn't matter, you have this internet facing application. Um, attackers are always going to be looking at those external facing applications, those applications that can be leveraged or accessed uh, from a remote point of view. So integrating security processes to there are gonna improve not only your application security, but the overall security of your organization. We know faster time to market. That's a huge stress, right? So if anyone's lived on a developer or an engineering team, the faster and the cadence of releases is increasing exponentially. The way that those increase, we know that we need to release software faster. We need, I mean, how many times are your apps updating on your phone? It's multiple times a day, twice a day. It used to be, you know, we used to update applications once every six months and it was this big major release. So that's not a, a, a reality anymore. So we need to be faster to market as an absolute benefit for your company as a whole from the business perspective, not only from the security perspective. Building better quality software. Nobody wants to, no developer, no engineering team, no one wants to fix bugs. Bug fixing is boring, it's tedious, it wastes a lot of time and it wastes a lot of money. By building more resilient and better software uh, of a better quality, we're gonna reduce our bug time and reduce our time fixing problems later in the cycle. Um, obviously, we can tie a lot of things into that that are not only security related, a lot of regression testing in QA, but there's a lot of security testing that can be augmented or actually put in place with those regression tests or the QA. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of that later. Um, reducing cost. This one's controversial because everybody's, you know, there, there's a lot of folks out there that say, okay, you find bugs earlier, you fix them, it saves you money. Um, yes. Th that's true, but again, looking at it from an attacker perspective, if I can find and fix vulnerabilities before they go out to prod, um, where someone is gonna, as soon as I make a change to a site, it's gonna be scanned. We have customers all the time that are say, oh, well, we can't scan that because it's production, it's internet facing, it's okay, well, I, I, news for everybody or not news for everybody, the minute you stand anything up on the internet, it's getting scanned. Um, and so finding and fixing these bugs or these vulnerabilities before that is going to save you cost. And this is, these metrics are gonna look completely different for everybody. Every organization is gonna have a different metric or different metrics that they focus on to begin with. But it's important that if we can serve those folks at the top echelon of the people that are serving our business side with metrics that show uh, increased time and money savings, it's going to be exponentially easier for you to move forward in your DevOps processes or security in your DevOps processes. Uh, we know efficiency, uh, reducing manual effort, reducing tickets and bugs, all of that's gonna save you time. I mean, we know that one of the main things that a lot of developers or automation teams do is their sole job is to automate. The more you automate, the more money you save. 
So just from that point alone and reducing cycles for fixing bugs and vulnerabilities is going to save you money. How you break this down to your specific organization or how you report these specific metrics may be very different um, depending on your organization, your business lines, et cetera. But the important thing to know is to be able to utilize metrics showing that automation and building that security in earlier in the pipeline does actually, in fact, impact your bottom line on ROI. So enough of the uh, business talk here. Let's, let's get to the point where this is something that, again, the failure and success of DevOps that I've seen repeated over a number of years in consulting engagements, et cetera, beyond public sector, private sector, et cetera, has really fallen to one thing and that one thing in common. So maybe dating myself a little bit here, having a little bit of fun with the audience, I don't know. But uh, what does Soylent Green, and, uh, a Soylent Green and a successful DevSecOps program have in common? And everybody here, I'm hoping, understands this reference. Just shout it out if you want. There you go, people. So again, time and time again, the success and the failure comes down to the people and the communication that is required to implement successful DevOps. Now, let's dig into that a little bit. What does that mean? So I'm gonna spend the most or the majority of my focus here on this recurring theme of the people in the process. So where do we start? Before we get to the slides, uh, we have two slides where I can tell you you're gonna see ultimate success or failure, and you're gonna be able to relate that to your organization. But before we get that, let's get some things out of the way. And that is the prep work, right? The, the scoping and the preparation for really what this means to be successful. Because without the prep, these next slides, these all build upon each other. So without the proper preparation, we're not gonna have the fundamentals down to be able to succeed. So when I say scope the effort, for this you know, number one preparation. First of all, let's ask, why are we doing this? Do we, do, do we have support? Do we have buy-in? Do we have the overall organizational desire to actually do this? Um, look, if we don't have executive buy-in, if we don't have it, something that's either mandated or something that we are getting pushed down to do, it's not gonna be successful. You need to have that successful buy-in. Um, you need to understand that this is going to take multitude, multitudes of levels of support to do successfully. And that does start at the top. Um, also, what does our app footprint look like? Uh, like if in your organization, how many applications do you have? How many are legacy? How many are not being updated or released on a normal basis? How many are being released and updated daily or monthly or weekly? Like what is my overall app footprint? look like. Um, and the reason I ask that is because we're going to want to scope down where we start. Are we going to start with just the more advanced applications or is there a group that we want to start with that has maybe the capabilities to say, hey, this, this group releases twice a day, they're very agile, they're on the more modern uh, pipelines for the specific software. These are the applications or APIs that they're releasing. Let's start there. Um, we have these legacy apps. We're not even going to bother with those legacy applications right now. We only update them once in a while. Uh, we're going to focus on you know, where we start. So we need that inventory. Um, as it is for anything else, understanding that it's impossible to secure what you don't know is there or what you don't understand. Um, and so um, there's a lot of that discovery process that goes into that. Um, the next one in my eyes as a foundation of a beginning is identifying owners and stakeholders. This is going to fall into multiple areas. One of the other biggest mistakes is that people get pigeonholed into, I have developers, I have security, and that's it. That's where I'm going to do my DevSecOps or my DevOps. There's so many more stakeholders than that. There are more participants than that. We have we have QA, we have business owners, we have product owners, we have folks that are, uh, that are extremely tied to uptime. Um, we have uh, SRE teams that are, are solely metric on, on the, you know, maybe 5.9 uptime or direct revenue impact that's tied to that uptime. 
We have a lot of different owners and stakeholders, and it's not only dev and security teams. That being said, the dev teams, engineering teams, and security teams will have a lot of processes that they own specifically, and we need to identify what those processes are and identify who's responsible for them. Third thing, let's look at metrics. Like, let's, let's, this is more of a hypothetical when you're starting. What does success look like for you? Um, I don't want to start with 10,000 applications and say, oh, DevOps, we have six months, let's go, 10,000 apps. Uh, that, that's not reality. Um, that's another key uh, indicator of failure. Um, so what we want to do there is understand what your success looks like. Do we start again with a very specific group of software or a, a, a dev factory, if you will, or a pipeline or something of that nature? And how do we improve? Like if we know that we're starting here, let's say we're starting with team A. Team A runs an app, it gets updated constantly. What do we want to do to show incremental improvement? Is incremental improvement mean one to three months we're adding one or two pipelines? Um, is that success for you? Um, what does what your overall success look like? And the reason I say that is because we have to understand what we're starting from, what we're trying to improve to, and what success looks like for your DevOps processes or your security processes in DevOps if that's where your focus is. We have to understand how we can get better and what exactly we're doing to get better and then be able to document that. Uh, the KISS is in there for my own reference, uh, the keep it simple stupid, right? Let's start very simple. Let's start with real ta uh, goals and look to execute upon that first. Um, I, I see a lot of um, other folks that are saying, okay, well, I, we don't need DevOps. We have an SDLC. Uh, why is DevOps or DevSecOps having to replace our SDLC? It's, it's not. What, what DevSecOps is doing is this is an incremental add-on or an incremental evolution, if you will, of your SDLC. You need to have an SDLC. Most people probably already have an SDLC, but what will I be doing beyond what I do for that formal SDLC? I'm building upon it. I'm making it better. It doesn't go away. Oh, we just spent all this time doing a secure SDLC. Great. All of these things will help mature and evolve that, mature, that level of secure SDLC no matter how far or, or behind it is. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not gonna get into version control and CICD here. However, that is just an example um, of, look, we, we, we use something of the nature of version control um, and we're looking to push that out into CICD as part of our SDLC, that's gonna be a part of that evolution. All right, this is the most crucial slide, everybody. This is the one, this is the one you've been waiting for. Um, this is the one where people fail. This is the one where people succeed. If, if you have one slide to take home with you and everyone will be able to get this, it's this slide. Everybody that fails in DevSecOps will fail at doing one thing here. Um, you know, it sounds a little bit cliche, but without a strong foundation, um, everything else is useless, right? Uh, and the same thing goes for a, de a DevOps program or a DevSecOps program. Anyone who's built anything understands that you can build the most beautiful high-rise building in the world, but if your foundation is garbage uh, and there's a sh slight shift in sand or whatever it is, uh, earthquake, et cetera, the whole thing topples over. All right, so where do people succeed and fail? Communication mechanisms is the number one thing I'm gonna start with. Yes, people, yes, communications, but mechanisms. All right, so let me, let me give you a hypothetical here. Um, let's say that our, let's say that our, our, our head of product for, or our business owner for product that talks mainly to developing the use case and functionality of that software has an entire team. Maybe they're 20, 30, 40 people on a product ownership team for maybe it's even an entire wing of business or a suite of business. And then you have my developers that are sitting over here. They, 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 these guys do nothing but pump out code all day, right? Um, 
These folks over here on the product side, they're very apt and used to communicating a certain way. Do they use an instant messaging? Do they have some, are they on Slack? Do they prefer Slack? Are they using email? Um, uh, what is the communication mechanism? Are they picking up the phone? Are they calling each other? These are real minor things. With these folks over here, they might not have read email in six weeks. They should. They probably signed something that they had to check their email once a day, but they don't. They're living and breathing JIRA tickets. They're living and breathing um, in GitHub or GitLab in their IDE, right? They're, they're using Visual Studio. If someone wants something, they ping them on Slack and those guys are communicating all day. Outside of their bubble of Slack and their IDEs, they're not communicating. Sure, if there's something major going on, their boss might say, hey, I need you to do this, but what's he doing? He's going, he or she's going through Slack, right? They're doing these. They have these communication mechanisms that work for them. Every department, every organization is going to have these groupings or these breakdown of what those communication mechanisms are. We're forming something that's going across multiple different organizations. Our stakeholders are members of these multiple different groups. So we need to establish communication mechanisms. We need to standardize that. We need to at least say, hey, look, for our DevOps procedures, this is the method and mode of communication and have everyone understand that. These, the cross-team collaboration, do these teams ever work together? We have, we have dev, we have security, and we have operations. Do they always work together? Um, no, they do a lot of things that do cross-function, but there's not a lot of standardization. There's not a lot of things that exist that allow those teams to work and, and work in an integrated fashion with the least amount of friction. So the cross-team collaboration, the communication mechanisms. Integrating, I mentioned earlier with the SDLC tooling and vuln management processes. All right, let's look, what do we have already? All right, everyone has something already. Uh, we have, okay, I'm using Tenable for my VM uh, that's doing endpoint and server, maybe some cloud management. Um, I have another group over here that is maybe running a very specific tool for SAST. Okay, well that exists, great. Um, I have another team over here that, uh, don't talk to us, we're just firewall. We do, we do our web application firewall, our CDNs, our Cloudflare admins, whatever. And then you have a whole other group that maybe is you know, responsible for your cloud entities, your, your cloud security posture management, your AWS admins, et cetera. We have all these dispersed processes and these dis dispersed tools that are not really working together. Let's understand what we have already. Let's understand what we can tie together already in this process and understand that that needs to be a documented part of developing our DevSecOps program, our DevOps program, or our, uh, excuse me, our SDLC improvement or evolution of. All right, the biggest one, this is, this, is, this is just as big as communication, again, on this slide, SLAs. No one likes them, nobody likes them. No one likes SLAs. We all need them, however, because look, establishing SLAs that everybody agrees upon is gonna be critical for the success of this program. I don't care if you start with one app, one pipeline, one API, I don't care what you start with. Um, you're gonna have to have SLAs that you all agree upon. Um, those SLAs don't have to be the same across the board. Um, obviously, if I have a business critical application that you know, my whole business relies on uh, that's external facing, I might wanna have a different SLA with that application. But the problem here is understanding the ownership and coming to agreement on those SLAs. Um, I'm gonna get into that a little bit further when I get into some of the tooling. Uh, but for right now, let's give you a hypothetical scenario that our tooling spits out uh, a critical finding uh, in an application. We fail a build. Let's say we fail a build because we found a critical vulnerability. Um, obviously, in a perfect world, that would do something like open a ticket, open a work stream, a Slack message, et cetera, et cetera, okay. So we have something that finds this, this security vulnerability, opens the ticket, sends a Slack message. Um, what does that look like? So how quickly do I need to 
respond to that? What are those agreed upon service level agreements that say, you know, look, we've talked about this, we've met about this, we'd have agreed on this, we've, we've communicated, we broke down those, those barriers for friction, and we said, look, if it's a critical and it's going out to this application, you have 24 hours that this thing has to be fixed and resubmitted for the build process to get retested. Um, if it's something not as important, maybe you have SLAs that are, you know, like let's say it's a medium vulnerability. Okay, great, maybe you have 30 days. It's a medium vulnerability, it's 30 days, we're not gonna fail a build on it. We'll pass the build, we'll flag it, open a JIRA ticket. You have 30 days to fix it. If you don't fix it within 30 days, it gets escalated. Um, something of that nature. These things can be, across the board, very, very, very different. But those SLAs need to include responsibilities and ownership for each one of those processes, right? Who owns the process? Who's following up on the process? Security shouldn't drive the process. Security should be the implementer of the checks and balances, meaning it's a trust and verify type of procedure. Uh, but development needs to agree to that beforehand to understand that they need to be able to fix these specific things on a certain time, timeline. All of this has to do with communication. Without the proper communication, without the proper fundamentals that you're building into this foundation of your program. Um, obviously, right, we looked at this slide here. We're, we're scoping effort, identifying owners. Again, I, I'm focusing very, very much on the people and the process rather than the tooling, which we're, we're gonna get into a little bit. But, these are the things that I've continuously seen the failure. Now, if you look for someone who has a failed DevSecOps program, oh, we tried that. I guarantee you, if you've tried it in the past, you're going to find something on this slide or this slide that was not done, that, that either was solely responsible or greatly influenced that failure. All right. Let's, let's go swimming for a bit. Let's dive into some of the process side of things. Okay. Requirements management. Very boring piece. Uh, no one wants to do requirements management. There's an important lesson in this requirements management. Um, I'm going to skip to number two real quick, and I'm going to tell a quick story. So. Uh, I think it was about three or four years ago, um, maybe longer, I don't know. COVID kind of threw my uh, time perception off a bit. Uh, I did a developer's workshop in San Diego um, at a Gartner Summit. And what this was was a little bit different. This was a hands-on uh, developer workshop to help security and developer teams come together. Um, and understand what they could and couldn't do, what their shortcomings were, what their difficulties were. And these, these folks signed up for the, it was a, you know, two, I think it was a two hour workshop. Um, very good attendance, I think we had about 40 people. The only prerequisite in the attendance was that you needed to have security representation and developer representation that wanted to come together for this workshop. Um, so all in all, 40 people, yes, probably only 20 companies because there was, uh, a variety of roles there, but um, what we did was, uh, it was, you know, the main part of it was I said, let's, let's just play a game. Let's play the OWASP Cornucopia card game. Has anyone heard or played the OWASP Cornucopia card game? Great. So it's a card game that starts out with basically two personas, essentially. You have developers and you have security folks. And they go through this, and when they play the game, you start with these cards. The cards give a premise for an application. The premise is, here's an app that does X. Okay. Then as they play the game, security is playing their cards, understanding what the security implications are, where the developers are saying, that's great, but I know I need to implement these five things. Meanwhile, the whole idea of this game this free card game, um, is to get these folks looking at the other's responsibility and focus and opening up that communication. Um, that was probably the most successful training endeavor that I've done in my career. I've received letters and notes and emails from actual impact that I made on those companies that attended that summit. 
Um, and most of it, not all of it, most of it was due to the communication and the understanding that went into this. So with this card game, we, 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 he said, what are the risks associated? How do we do this, right? A developer's like, okay, I need to say, okay, this has to be single sign-on. I'm gonna use this uh, particular mechanism. I'm gonna federate through here. Maybe I'm using OAuth, maybe I'm not. Uh, this is what the app has to do. This is the data that it has to access. How am I gonna get access to this data? And meanwhile, watching them look at that and, and walk through that creates this in, incredible kind of like series of, of events that lead a security person to say, huh, well, I just look at this app and I know that I'm gonna try to attack it in five different ways um, and I'm gonna use these tools. But what we're doing here is looking at requirements. We're looking at a step back to what security needs to be put in the design of this application. Ex exactly. Uh, what we need to have some type of thought from security and dev working together in secure design, understanding what the requirements are and what they're going to, what that app is going to do. There are free resources out there. You don't need to buy products and spend money. OWASP ASVS, Security Verification Standards. It's so it's a very very high level now. You, you you'll want to look at it, but you'll also want to develop upon it. It's going to say how sensitive is this application? I'm going to rank my applications in three buckets: super sensitive, semi sensitive not very sensitive. Internal only, it processes the parking data for my parking garage, I don't care about it. It's internal only, you know, employees have it. Publicly facing. Now, it's gonna give you a list of standards for each sensitivity level that must be met. Obviously, they're gonna be different for your, every org or every app, but it's gonna give you a really good baseline. What encryption am I using for the sign-in? Different over here than over here. Do I have a different level of, uh, of requirement when it comes down to, can, I'm gonna get, am I gonna get away with a different TLS version over there? You know, it's internal only, you have to be connected to a VPN, et cetera, et cetera, whereas this one's on the internet. There's gonna be a very complex passwords. Am I gonna have to do these? Um, what languages uh, are supported? How am I querying or pulling data? Um, where does this app live? Is it a cloud native app? Is it an app that sits on John's server over in the corner? Like these are all different things, but we have different security requirements and steps for each one of these sensitivities. So these are open source tools that you can use. Um, things like threat modeling, you're gonna get a little bit more advanced there. Uh, yes, there's gonna be some threat modeling and no, you're never gonna dive into threat modeling saying we need to threat model our apps. Okay, let's start out with just one new app that we're developing and perhaps do some secure design and threat modeling to that app, right? So how can that app be attacked? What are the things that are gonna be, um, that I need to know about that are, are going to enable security decisions in this application? Uh, what does my real life attack vector look like? Uh, you know, do I think that this is a, um, the sensitivities of the exposure of that application? All right, next we look at things like processes, right? So we're all, and when I say processes, I, I, I look at compliance too. So everyone's different regulatory scrutiny. Uh, some folks over here are gonna have to adhere to very strict guidelines for HIPAA. Okay, that's great, but I don't do anything with healthcare, I don't care. I do finance, I'm gonna be under a completely different set of guidelines. Can I use those guidelines or those corporate policies or that compliance to push forward perhaps some of my ideas and design? This is something where it's, I feel like everyone wants to jump into the tools and jump into these things where they don't say, okay, look, can I use compliance? Can I use compliance to drive some of this? Um, and that goes back to that first slide of that executive buy-in. Can I use compliance to push me forward? Can I use, uh, maybe it's data sovereignty and you know that you have to have your app segregated depending on you know, the amount of data or what country this specific application's being operated in. Um, all of these things will kind of follow into some of the process um, and it's gonna really guide you. But the most important part here is to communicate throughout this entire process and involve the people in these decisions of communication. All right, architecture. 
So we're winding down here. I'm going to get into tooling in a minute, um, but architecture. Um, do we use things right now that are going to enable and help us? And who are the people responsible? Are we using only trusted components? If we are, who's deciding what these trusted components are? What, where are our SDKs and our libraries coming from? Uh, what infrastructure are these applications running on? Uh, are we using infrastructure as code? Who's looking at that code? Are, we, are these things all piped out to cloud? Um, are these instances where these are legacy apps running on physical servers or, or hardware? Um, all of these things need to be taken into consideration. All of these pieces for architecture are not just the architecture of your apps, but also the architecture of your deployment models. Remember, your DevSecOps is going to go from before code is written, meaning the, the process and the planning session, all the way to the developers writing the code. Hopefully they have some IDE plugins in their console where they're saying, oh, you just made a huge mistake. That's a SQL injection. The developer's like, you know, no one else sees it but them. They fix it. They move on. Um, and then you're going to go to look at where these things are, uh, the entire process, right? The builds that I mentioned earlier, passing builds, having, having the compiles and the builds be able to be scanned at real time to be able to be scanned while they're in that build process. All of this infrastructure is all part of it, right? Are we using secure components from start to finish? Are we designing this securely? Are we using tools that are gonna give me secure uh, implementations? I mentioned the ops processes. Again, are we using hardened images um, are in containers? Uh, what, what are we doing to deploy these? Uh, all of our APIs, are they using proper uh, authorization and, and uh, authentication. Are we, are we pushing this forward in a method that we know that our components are also secure? Again, a lot of different people involved when I'm talking about an API gateway or infrastructure as code versus somebody who's writing, um, again, the application at the code level versus someone who's saying, okay, I found a cross-site scripting vulnerability. What does this mean? What are our SLAs? There's so many different owners and pieces of this that that communication is the most key part and understanding that you're going to have to communicate, over-communicate, and take the people that you're working with much more into a fact, into a factor in than, than probably previously mentioned. All right. This is the part where everyone jumps in. Everyone jumps in at these magic pipelines. They want to they, they, they make sure that they have everything. I mentioned the tooling is, is so much more. It, it's, your, it's your communication methods. It's your, am I using Slack? Am I using email? Am I, am I using Teams? Um, you know, am I, Jira, what does the SLAs look like? like what are, how are these SLAs being measured? Everyone wants to dive in here and say, okay, well, look, um, this is my CI CD pipeline. These are the tools I'm throwing in here. Well, that's great. You can throw in a lot of different tools, probably most of which you already own, some that you might need to procure, some that you might want to change, et cetera. But everybody wants to jump into this tooling. And anyone who starts over here with some, you know, you might have a wizard at your company that is magical on the CI CD and tooling side, and that's great but you can't ignore those previous issues with the people and the communication mechanisms and things that need to be ironed out. Now, the reason I bring this slide up too is because I, I, I developed this slide for Gartner years ago or this image on the bottom left. And it's, it's really, really valuable, but you have to understand in an extremely finite scope of AppSec in CICD and what should be done where and how. This right here, you know, I, again, I said start in the IDE, use software composition analysis, use static code analysis, use DAST, et cetera. All of the people that want to jump in here, I promise you're going to get that failure without the proper presentation and preparation of the people slides, the people and communication that's going to make any of this possible to work. And look at this. What is this? process of failing builds or passing builds or passing vulns without SLAs that everyone agrees upon. Um, these are things that are really foundational. Uh, don't jump in here. We all want to get here, uh, but we can't jump in there immediately. All right. 
Integration. Yes, we need to integrate. Integrating security tooling into, into the DevSecOps program, identify appropriate tooling. Your appropriate tooling may exist. You might have pieces of it. Um, you need to seamlessly integrate. You need to establish these in the best and most dev-friendly centric manner possible. Again, be dev-friendly, be dev-centric, because what we're doing is we're shifting a bit of that responsibility. Um, I'm not up here. I have not said shift left one time since I've been up here on purpose um, because I don't think it's necessarily accurate. Um, sh sure, hyperbole, it's accurate enough in that we want to shift some of that security, but yes and no. It's, it's a shared responsibility that is an evolution that occurs. And that needs to be done, again, in a very dev-centric and dev-friendly uh, methodology that all has to do with making sure that those proper communication mechanisms and silos are really broke down. We need to make sure that it's not a security versus ops versus dev type of atmosphere. All right, continuous, as in forever. Yes, forever. You're never going to be great. You're never going to be done. You're always going to be improving. That's the, another thing that I wanted to basically just bring up here is that you are always going to look to get better. There is nobody out there, not Google, not Apple, not anybody who's doing everything perfectly. Um, they're never done. You are never done. You are always continuously improving. The goal here is to understand that what does, what does getting better look like? If, if I can improve a little bit on a continual basis, that is success. If I can start with one pipeline and it, okay, it killed me for six months to be able to get this one product fully implemented into DevOps, what lessons have I learned? What mistakes have I made? What can I close? What are loops or holes that I found that I can plug to make that continuous improvement better for everyone and all stakeholders? It's that continuous improvement that's going to really, really push your DevOps program or your DevSecOps program to be impactful or successful. That continuous improvement. And learn from your mistakes. Do not bury them. Do not be embarrassed. Learn from them. Learn from the mistakes. Learn from the mistakes that people make in code. Someone screws something up and there's a major vuln that fails a build on a critical. Let's, let's look at it. Let's learn from it. Let's not embarrass anybody. Let's use that to get better. Uh, again, having people's feelings and psychology as part of knowing we're all in this. These are, this is jobs for us, but we all have the ego. We all have wanting to be perfect or wanting to be better. You can't embarrass anyone. You need to learn lessons, move forward with those lessons, and be very people-centric and have those things into consideration when you're doing DevOps. All right. Summary. Quickly, evaluate your current state of practices and processes. Establish clear goals and objectives. Promote training and communications. Implement dev-friendly testing and automated security processes. Utilize CICD, obviously, to get to maximum potential. Constantly improve. But if there's one thing that I need to state over and over and over and over again, it's that everybody wants to get here. And this is another image that uh, I actually co-produced this image so I can use it. Or at least that's what I'm going to go with. So everybody wants to get to this very mature figure eight seamlessly moving piece of DevSecOps where we're doing secure design and externalized security and we're doing development verification and production security monitoring. Everyone wants to get here. And, that, and that's great. Everyone should want to get there. Everyone wants to jump into the tooling. Everybody wants to implement all of these different tools. Yes, should you want to get here? Yes, you should be striving for this. Do you want to get to something that looks like this? Yes, ideally we do. But it's not possible without the one, the number one largest asset that every single business and company has, people. And people need to communicate. And that is exactly what the premise, and again, the over 90% of the success and failures of DevSecOps programs and security programs in AppSec and Dev that I've seen over the years all come down to people and communication and the failure only relates to this. Um, I'm going to hold this slide up here, additional resources and books if anyone's interested. 
Uh, this curated list I just put together real quick, but uh, I find these to be pretty good references. Um, big fan of OWASP and open source, um, but obviously you can see that here. Um, I thank everybody. Um, I, I have a, two slides that are questions and thank you. I'm going to leave that because I think this slide's more important. But I want to thank everyone for their time. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to come up to me um, either in front of everyone or over here to the side, and I'll be happy to help you out. Thank you.